Greetings and salutations. Thanks for clicking on the video. Today we're going to look at Oracle VM VirtualBox. I'm going to show you how to get a virtual machine running in VirtualBox and this is going to be a very generalized video gang. VirtualBox is complicated software. There are lots and lots of options and the best thing that you can do is to read as much as you can, go through the documentation, look through f uh, forums, this is how you can learn how to use it. It's open source and it's widely available and it works on all platforms which is really cool. So if you're running Windows or you're running a Macintosh, it doesn't matter. You can still do what I'm going to show you how to do in VirtualBox. It's not the only option out there, of course. Uh, you've got VMware and a few other virtualizers that you can play around with, but this one is kind of an industry standard for testing different distributions of Linux which is the reason why I would assume that you'd want to run it. So here we go. I'm also going to assume that, you, assume that you have it installed, that you've gotten it from the repositories if you're running Linux Mint like I am or downloaded the deb files or the exe files. If you are installing this on Mac or Windows then I would suggest that you go and get the installation from the actual Oracle website don't go to uh, other sites that may offer a download because you don't know what might be bundled with it. It's just a good safety precaution when using open source software. So let's jump into configuring our machine and I'm assuming that you have this installed and that you have your extension packs for your current version of VirtualBox installed. The current version as of the recording of this video is 5.0. I'm actually using 4.3. I did use 5.0 for a little while but I ran into some issues so I rolled back to 4.3 so that's what we're going to be working in today. However, there's not that huge of a difference between 4.3 and 5.0 and there probably won't be between 5.2 either. So this video should stay uh, pretty useful for a while. I'm going to zoom in to make this easier for you guys to see. I do know that it creates two pointers but that's just how the screen capture software works when you zoom. So hopefully that's not too annoying. Let's create a new virtual machine. The more you know about computer hardware, the easier this is going to be to do. All right. If you don't know a great deal about hardware, uh, you might be scratching your head trying to figure out what we're doing because what this software does is it, it uh, creates a virtual computer. It fools the guest operating system that we're going to be installing into thinking that it's running on a piece of hardware when it isn't. And uh, what's really cool is, is that we can change parameters about the hardware, which in real life would be difficult to change. We can change the amount of memory. We can change the number of cores in the CPU, all kinds of stuff. Now, the first thing we're going to do is choose the name of our operating system. This could be anything you want it to be. And uh, I put in Zubuntu because that's the one I'm going to use for an example today. And it also automatically figured out that that's Linux because... Zubuntu is uh, Ubuntu with the XFCE desktop, also known as XUbuntu, but I call it Zubuntu. And then, of course, it'll ask us what the architecture of our OS is going to be, and you need to know what this is in advance, of course, whether you're running 64 or 32 bit. And uh, that goes the same for Windows. You need to make sure that you have, know whether you're going to install 64 or 32 bit. So, we chose the name, we can rock on here. First thing it's going to ask us to do is allocate some memory, realistic memory for a Linux distribution with a GUI is 248 megabytes, which is two gigabytes. You might be able to get away with one gigabyte, but anything below that and it's going to run very slow. So, we've chosen our memory, let's move on. Next thing we're going to do is create a virtual hard drive. This is a file that will live on the host hard drive uh, that will look like a real hard drive to the operating system running as a guest. And we need to choose a file format for that. These are different file formats that are recognized by different kinds of virtualizers. The only two that you really need to be concerned with are the VirtualBox version, which is the VDI, and the VMDK, which is what VMware uses and then there are some other formats here and the only reason that I think that you'd ever really want to choose VMDK is if you were going to attempt to export a VirtualBox virtual machine 
to a VMware installation and that's complicated and most people wouldn't bother to do that so VDI is fine it's no big deal all right the next question it's going to ask you is whether it's going to be dynamically allocated or you're going to allocate the full drive size at the get-go um, dynamically allocated means that it will actually only take up as much space on the host as the virtual operating system is actually using so I could allocate 40 gigabytes let's say to the um, to the uh, guest machine but if that guest machine is actually only using 8 gigabytes that's how much it's going to take up now that will grow over time and if you are going to be actually using your virtual machine um, if you end up putting 20 gigabytes worth of crap on it even if you delete it that um, that dynamically allocated disk is going to grow to 20 gigabytes and it's going to stay there there is a way to shrink that down and it's a process that you can go through there's some software that you would install on the virtual drive and then you would um, run it and it would do all kinds of craziness it's a bit complicated uh, the moral of the story is even if you're dynamically allocating a disk don't make it bigger than the, the hard drive space that you actually have available for it like here I know for a fact I'm using an SSD I have maybe 60 gigabytes of free space on it but it's going to allow me to tell this machine it has a two terabyte drive so in reality i'm going to give it 40. 32 would be plenty for linux but i kind of like 40 because it's like i'm working with one of those um old machines that uh we used to when the 40 gigabyte drives were very popular kind of makes me feel like i'm working with one of those old machines hope that makes sense all right uh those are the basic settings they're in there we could actually boot the machine and start it now but the truth of the matter is we need to go through and tweak and hold on a second let me grab this phone we will turn that off so it's not bugging us as we go through the video all right general settings here we have uh, the stuff that we already filled in the snapshots folder just leave that where it is unless you have a reason for moving it a snapshot you can create a visual image of or a, a virtual image of the machine um, that will hang on to the state that it's in when you create the snapshot so basically what that means is all right you get your machine set up and then you think well I'm gonna install a bunch of software and see how that works and it might screw up the machine I'll take a snapshot first I'll make my changes and if I do screw up the machine and it doesn't work, I can roll back to the snapshot. So that's the, the idea there. Sharing the clipboard between the host and the guest. Uh, you'll need drivers installed on the virtual machine to do this. I'm going to show you how to install those drivers later in the video. I always click bi-directional. You can also drag and drop files back and forth from the guest to the host. And as long as you have the drivers installed. When the virtual machine is in full screen mode, there's a little drop-down menu. You can decide whether that's on the top or the bottom. In our case, I'm going to put it at the top. The default is the bottom. And, of course, that depends on the UI that you're running and whether that will conflict with where the taskbar is and that sort of thing. Moving on to system here, there's not much that we need to change. We're going to tell it that we we'll give it at least uh, two CPUs. Okay. The host machine here has a three-core CPU, but what's interesting about this software is that it'll, it'll allow me to tell the, the virtual machine there's more than it's in the machine. So I can tell it there's five when there's not five. Most modern software written for um, Linux uh, and any operating system is looking for multi-core. So if you run it with one CPU, it's really not going to have the performance. I mean, yeah, you can run it with one CPU just to see what it does. But if you want any kind of realistic performance out of the applications you run on the virtual machine, you need to go ahead and allocate more than one processor, okay? And the acceleration should be set by default, so we don't need to mess with that. Go to the display, and we want to give it all of the video memory that we can, which the the top limit is 128 and we want to make sure that 3d acceleration is enabled especially if you're running something with a desktop like unity or cinnamon or gnome uh, that uses a lot of uh, acceleration 
And we can set up all kinds of other things here. Remote displays and video capture. We're not going to mess with any of that. This is pretty, pretty simple. We will come back to storage because that's the hardest one to set up. I just want to look at a couple of others here. Mainly network. Network is um, how you're going to decide how your virtual machine gets out to the web. If it's set to NAT, it's going to get out to the web just like your, um, your web browser does. In other words, this virtual machine is going to look to the internet like a big web browser and it's going to be the same IP address as the host machine it's running on. Uh, most of the time this is perfectly fine for running a virtual machine, but if your virtual machine is going to have any kind of a server on it that needs to get its own web address, uh, its own IP address, uh, to work on the network, then you want to change that to bridged. But running bridged all the time is not necessary. Some people will say automatically to switch to bridged. And uh, you really only need that if, if that machine is going to be serving files. Okay, so let's uh, look at audio real quick. Uh, this works by default, shouldn't need to be messed with. Uh, USB devices, if you want to hook things like webcams, printers, stuff like that, that would be connected to the host. This will allow you to pass those devices through and the guest will control them. This is the part that messes people up and this is storage, okay? And what you're looking at here is these controllers are just like physical controllers on a motherboard. So you have a SATA controller and an IDE controller. It's kind of a throwback. A lot of modern motherboards don't have any IDE, but roll with it, okay? And what we can do here is we can attach virtual drives to this or physical drives in the big machine. So if I had a disk in the uh, DVD drive on the host machine, then I could attach that drive uh, as our DVD drive to this IDE controller, and then I could uh, boot the machine off of a real physical DVD. In reality, we use ISO images to um, install files on virtual machines, install operating systems, we use those files. I hope that makes sense, yes. And so we need to attach that as if it were a drive. Now, if I had an actual install DVD or CD that I was going to use to install my operating system, I wouldn't do jack here. I'd just click OK, drop that into the host drive's drive, start up the machine, it will detect it and go, hey, do you want to use the host drive? And we say yes, and we roll on with our life. But we're using an ISO file, so we need to attach that. And here's how you do it. Click on the IDE controller. We want to add CD or DVD device. And we're going to choose the disk. If we leave it empty, we're just going to have an empty controller with nothing in it, OK? But we're actually going to choose a disk. And I keep mine in a, a file called a, a folder called ISO that's in the virtual uh, machine VMs folder in my home folder. I have three disk images available to us. We want Zubuntu today. So I click on that and now it shows up as a drive that is attached to that controller. Pretty nifty, huh? Now once you have all these settings set up and you got it the way you want to, make sure that you come down here and click OK because if you don't, you'll lose all that work. So let's click OK. Now our virtual machine is set up and we can boot it up and we can actually start installing the operating system. So let's do that now. And to do that, we can click start or double click the machine. Either way, here we go. And we're booting up as we speak. And we are at the Zubuntu install. So I'm gonna tell it I'm going to install Zubuntu. Now this video is not about installing an operating system into the virtual machine. This is about working with the virtual environment itself. So I'm not gonna go through the Zubuntu install process here. I'm going to install the machine. I'm gonna get it up and running and then I'm gonna show you how to install the guest edition drivers when I'm done that will um, allow you to integrate the host and guest operating systems in a, a much more seamless way. So we're going to go ahead and pause the video here. I'm going to let this install and when it's done we'll come back and we'll install the guest editions. Alright, our operating system is installed. We are ready to move on to getting it set up to run in the virtual environment. 
So I'm going to show you something here that just, this may or may not work because it, it all depends. It's sort of a, a running joke uh, for people who play around with VirtualBox a lot is that usually when you go to restart, the machine will just lock up entirely. So we'll see what it does with Zubuntu. I've told it that I want to restart. And it's going through the shutdown procedure. And... Let's press enter because that's what it's looking for. It's going to try and eject that disk. It actually worked this time. That's amazing. So we're going to restart our virtual machine. And VirtualBox is usually pretty good about knowing that it is a uh, installation disk and it will actually eject the installation disk we hooked up. So it did that this time. So we're booted into the operating system, which is pretty cool. So let me log in. And we should get a desktop. We hope. All right, and we have a very tiny desktop. It's running, yay. And the problem here is that, watch this, I'm going to put it in full screen mode it does not resize the desktop and we cannot drag and drop files back and forth between the host and the guest and none of those things are actually going to work because there's no drivers in here uh, that integrate the uh, virtual machine with the actual physical host machine now we certainly can look around the operating system here but it would be nice to have a bit more control and so we need to install something called guest editions. I'm going to zoom in here to make this easier to see. And we need to open up a terminal in the um, machine that we're going to be installing guest editions in. This, by the way, applies only to Linux, what I'm about to show you. For a Windows or Mac virtual machine, it would be very different. And Linux is the most complicated of the bunch to get this going in. The first thing that you need to do, regardless of where you get the drivers from, is make sure that the distribution of Linux that you're running has a couple of files installed already. Now this is 1404. I know for a fact that they are there, but I'm going to show you how to make sure they are there. So the command that you would run at your terminal here is which, which means we're looking for a program to be installed. And the program that we're looking for is called Make, M-A-K-E. This must be installed in, in order for the VirtualBox drivers to go into the machine. And guess what? It is actually here, which is very good. Let's do another one. Which GCC, the GNOME C compiler, has to be here as well. And GCC is installed. That's very good. And the other thing that needs to be here is the Linux headers for the current running kernel. If you don't have these installed, then you cannot install the video drivers to make the accelerated video work in your virtual machine, and you will not get the uh, drag and drop functions and the resizing of the screen and all that stuff. So there are several places where you could get these drivers you can get them out of the repositories there are uh, there's a version that's in there that works about 50 percent of the time the best way to do it is to actually do it from the um, cd that has the software that comes along with your um, virtual machine virtualizer it's actually part of oracle and the way we do that is we go to devices and we are going to install guest editions CD image. It's just like I'm sticking a disk in the virtual drive here. And you'll see it pops up. And there's an auto run, but it doesn't work. And it opens up a term, it opens up a file manager, and you see that we have a whole bunch of files on here, okay? So what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna go ahead and get out of that and we're going to open up a terminal. We're going to do this manually to install our uh, guest editions. So the first thing that we need to do is find the the CD in our file system where it's mounted. 
and we know for a fact that it will be in media so I'm going to switch to the media directory all right and it's mounted under the user Joe so CD Joe and then I'm going to do an LS and you're going to see there's that disk and it is uh, mounted and boy that's a lot of crap to try and type so I'm just going to make it, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to copy this. All right. And now I'm going to jump into that directory. CD. Paste. There we go. And I'm going to list the files that are on that CD. And you see we've got a bunch here because we have files that are intended to uh, install this on all of the other host operating systems or, or whatever the guest operating system should be, is currently running so it's the same CD with the same software but yet if you had a Windows virtual machine running or a Linux or a Mac it's all gonna come from here so what file do we need to actually use the one that we need to use is VBox Linux editions run right there so we're going to run that file. We need to do it with super user privileges. So it's sudo and then dot slash. That basically tells the system that we want to run this file that's in this directory right here, right now. And we'll make this easy on myself yet again. And I'm going to copy it. Okay. And we're going to put it there. And then I'm going to enter to execute the command and it asks for my password and here we go and this is actually going to take the source code and compile it into a kernel module which will add to the running kernel and so when it boots up the drivers will automatically be a part of the system and it's telling me that it did not do the DKMS so that means that something's not here that needs to be here oh no it is doing it okay it is doing it. I thought it didn't it says the headers for the current running kernel were not found if the following uh, it, it says that every time I do this but yet it, it works and even messed me up see virtual box developers you could make this a lot easier I mean you really could but it's sort of the way it is and what it's doing right now is it's compiling the drivers for the kernel and it's taking its time and now it's building the uh, shared folder module so we can drag and drop the files that's done so it's successful it said it worked it said it's done even though it said it couldn't find the headers if uh, you do not have make if you do not have GCC if you don't have the headers installed and it can't find the, that software then what it will do is is it will not create those kernel modules and you'll get about half of the features running and it doesn't work very well at all so that's done. You could also uh, do the same thing we just did by uh, going into the repositories and downloading the guest editions. I already mentioned that, but what the point that I wanted to stress was is that only works some of the time. And you do have to make sure that the make and GCC is there or it won't install anyway. So you might as well do it manually. Once you have those installed, you want to restart the virtual machine. We're going to do that right now. Make sure our uh, everything's working. And here we go yes I think we got it working because it resized the screen automatically so what I should be able to do here is log in this will take it a second to get itself together 
And now when I resize the screen, this is how you know they're working, I can do that. Now, I had put this up top. Zubuntu, by default, puts the panel at the top. So, to make that make sense, uh, let's go ahead and move that panel down. Lock the panel, unlock the panel. Boom, 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 boom. So there we have it. And when we're in full screen mode like this, we have access to the virtual machine controls uh, through this little menu. But I'm going to go ahead and get out of this. And one of the things I do want to show you is, is that uh, we were dinking around with all those hard drives and, and, and CD drives and things like that. You can actually get to those settings um, while the machine is running, just like so you can take disks out and add them in. So go to storage, and like we don't need guest editions hooked up here, so we could uh, uh, eject the attachment. Maybe that's here that you can do that. Devices, CD, there we go. So IDE and we can remove the disk from the virtual drive. We do that here. So anyway, that is basically how this works. And you can play around with this yourself. Of course, ejecting the disk will do exactly the same thing. I'll just go ahead and do that. There we go, eject the volume. Boom, it's gone. All right, so anyway, you can go on and, and create your own virtual machines and, and play with them and do all kinds of crazy stuff and build your own Linux distribution and install a server farm running on your host machine, whatever you wanna do, the sky's the limit. Uh, virtualization is a lot of fun to play with and get started with. It also can be very frustrating and you may run into issues. Different distributions of Linux run better or worse depending on the distribution on virtual machines. Most Ubuntu's, anything based on Ubuntu, runs pretty good. And um, OpenSUSE runs nicely in a virtual environment. Um, but other distributions may be harder to get set up, harder to get the guest editions into, all kinds of stuff. It's just, uh, it's kind of a... <laughs> new frontier playing around with this technology uh, you are on the cutting edge and you don't know what you're going to run into so anyway thank you for watching the video i know this was a long video but it's kind of a deep and involved process and if you've watched it all the way to the end you should be able to get started with VirtualBox and have some degree of success so thanks for watching. If you'd like me to help you get started with Linux, be sure and check out easylinux.com. The link is in the description below. We will talk again soon. See ya.